Mike, um, please, could we start with you giving us a brief intro of yourself, of the company, and um, why you're here today? Sure. So I, I started my career back in the late 90s at Wells Fargo, so traditional financial services. Uh, and I ran capital markets and product development proprietary trading for the bank. Um, I left in 2000 to do my first startup, which was a wealth management technology that I, I sold to Broadridge. Um, I left that to start a hedge fund that I, I still run today. It's become a family office, but uh, you know, got me back in the markets. Um, and then in 2011, I started SoFi with some colleagues, uh, grew that, and you know, obviously a public company today. And then I left uh, in 2000, early 2018 to start Figure. And the whole motivation behind what we were trying to do with Figure and what I think we've been able to start accomplishing is you know, we have this fundamental belief about blockchain and blockchain's ability to transform markets. And that belief is really rooted in the fact that the blockchain does two things that are incredibly powerful. It allows you to displace trust with truth to native digital assets. So it allows me to look at an asset and know for certain the composition, the ownership, the history, and it allows you to transact bilaterally without counterparty risk or settlement risk. So when you intersect those two things, you can start creating markets you're agnostic to your counterparty about. That's a huge deal for financial services because we think about how do financial services markets work, everything is intermediate. So when we trade stock, there's seven parties that sit in between a buyer and seller. When we swipe a debit card, there's five parties that sit in between a buyer and seller. Those intermediaries represent trillions of dollars of market cap. So if blockchain's successful in what it needs to do, you can disintermediate that to just the buyer and seller and free that trillion dollars that sits in between up. Now, do you think that's happening? Because my impression is that it's actually going the opposite way. Um, it feels like rather than blockchain replacing existing financial market uh, infrastructure and market structure, it's just actually become yet another asset to trade via financial intermediaries. We have PBs, we have custodians, we have exchanges. The same intermediaries, so, what's going on? So it's a great question. And, and so let me start off with, we've had an enormous amount of success on blockchain on certain asset classes. So we began originating loans on blockchain in 2018. Uh, we did the first warehouse that year, did the first securitization in March of 2020, did the first AAA rated securitizations this year, and more recently just did a transaction where the bonds themselves are native to blockchain. They're not on DTC or Euroclear. And so to date, we've done about $15 billion of transactions on chain, including a billion and a half in third quarter um, of real world asset transactions. So there is activity that's happening, but I think you hit on one of the salient points, which is the premise of blockchain, that, that, de that trust versus truth and the ability to transact bilaterally is predicated on decentralization. And the, the crazy thing is crypto is a necessary component for blockchain to work, and most crypto trades on centralized exchanges. And so there's you know, no doubt an irony of that, and, and that's one of the things that we're leaning in to try to change. So what's real decentralization? What does that mean to you? Because the IOSCO just a few days ago said uh, that you know, a lot of the DeFi applications and DeFi uh, platforms actually just masquerade as decentralized entities. There's always someone responsible. There's, you can always find that person. So what does that mean to you? What's a real decentralized exchange versus a centralized one? So, so you can start off with the, the exchanges today predominantly aren't even close to being decentralized. So if you think about how, how a Coinbase or a Binance or an FTX before it imploded worked, you have the custodian, the marketplace, and the clearing all happening under one roof. Mm. So there's no financial market that actually works like that. So everything is bifurcated out because when you have all that under one roof, you can introduce malfeasance. And we obviously had a lot of malfeasance a couple of years back. So, so, but even breaking those things out, the challenge that you have in particular for things like trading across multiple level one networks is the assets or the tokens aren't sitting on that same network. So trying to encumber them has proven difficult. And the default that people try to lean into is, okay, we'll use the custodian as a, as a, as a trusted oracle. So the custodian will represent, I have Bitcoin, I have ETH, I have whatever it is that I want to transact to. And the problem with that is you're trusting the custodian. It goes back to that trust versus truth. And, and people would say, well, why can't you trust a custodian? And I'd say, well, Prime Trust and Fortress were two great examples of why not to trust a custodian. So we've been, the, the industry in general has been developing technology, in particular around MPC, multi-sig wallet structure, that effectively allows you to identify that there is an asset in a particular address 
to shard the key for that address in a way that no one entity has unilateral control of it. So a qualified custodian can still function as a custodian, but they can't take the asset out of the, out of the address. And, and in doing so, you can actually create a true decentralized construct. And so I think this is what we've been missing. And I, I think that this is not just around trading crypto, it's around trading securities, it's around trading other assets. We need true decentralization to realize the actual value proposition of the technology. And that, that, that I think is starting to happen. And this decentralized world that you envisage, it sounds like it still has custodians, it still has those intermediaries. Is it regulated? Yeah, and, and that's why the custodian's there, because as an RIA, you need a qualified custodian. The SEC still requires that. And so, but that doesn't mean that the custodian's actually a true intermediary, right? What they are is a part of a process at the regulatory But I framework. imagine they collect a fee. They, they collect less fees. So, so for example, when we did the first securitization of blockchain assets, we had a thesis that we could save 90 basis points of cost from origination through to deal expense. And part of that savings was around getting rid of the indentured trustee, reducing the cost the custodian charge, because now they're there as name only. They're not actually taking possession of documents and holding on to them. And when we did that first transaction in March of 2020, we ended up saving about 117 basis points of cost. So you know, there's real value that's coming to market through this. What's stopping this uh, decentralization story and what's pushing it towards uh, the centralized exchanges? Because let me put you, put to you my theory, which is that people want a complaints department. So when, uh, when I first got my alternative trading system through the SEC, so I, I have a broker dealer and an ATS, and the ATS allows me to trade blockchain native securities and they sell, settle, self-clear. It's the only ATS that exists to do that. And we, we did the first marketplace for our own equity back in November of 21. And when I was working with FINRA to get approval for it, I sat down and they said, well, who do you call when a trade breaks? And you know, I made the mistake of saying, well, a trade can't break because you have to encumber the bid and encumber Man, the offer. Wrong answer. It was the absolute wrong answer. You know, they, they, they threw coffee at me and told me I was an idiot. And, and so I very quickly said, well, you call the administrator. So I made up an administrator. I've created a phone number for the administrator. And you know, for three years of running that marketplace, no one ever called the administrator. So <laughs> if blockchain works the right way, you don't need a centralized admin. OK, um, let's talk about some, a new story I read recently, um, which kind of is puzzling a little bit for me, because you know, you're clearly advocating for decentralized uh, market structure. But apparently, you're also wondering about buying FTX. So, um, so what I can say to that, it, it's, it's been in the press and you know, that we have interest in it. L let me rewind it a little bit and set some context for it, which is I believe there's a way to establish a truly decentralized marketplace and I believe that you can adopt best in class things like netting and cross collateral margining. So for example, when you trade on blockchain marketplaces today and you run a long and a short position of the same asset, you have to independently margin each side of that trade. Mm. That doesn't make any sense. You should be able to net it. You should be able to have more than just one asset as collateral against the trade. So there's value in netting. There's value in cross-collateralization. There's value in better margining. So margining that's fully encumbered where you actually have security. And there's value in the ability to offer up collateral into the process. So it's, it's public as part of the Celsius bankruptcy that we've been designated as a loan refinancing agent for that transaction. And, and what we're doing is lifting out $300 million of loans and $500 million of collateral. That collateral will go into Delaware Granter Trust that we can then lend into a marketplace as, as for the ability for borrow and for short. And so I think there's a really interesting backdrop. What I like about the bankruptcy transactions that's very unique is if someone wanted to go to the SEC in the US today and do an S1, the SEC, for, for a blockchain company where the security is trading native on the blockchain, it's not trading at DTC or in a traditional uh, uh, centralized market, I don't think they'd allow you to do it. But US Bankruptcy Code has a provision called 1145, and 1145 allows you to issue the equity through the bankruptcy court. Mm. The SEC will allow you to do that, and then that allows you to actually create a public equity native on blockchain. So you can imagine if, if, hypothetically, we were to bid in and restart an exchange, how cool it would be if that exchange was public trading on itself. Um, would it be cool? 
That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> it's a milestone transaction. And I think what it would do is it would demonstrate that it's not just crypto on decentralized marketplaces. It's equity, it's things like our loans and asset-backed securities. You know, as I said, where we've done $15 billion of those things where basically it's an everything marketplace. So what you should have is one place that you go and, and the value of being able to go from Bitcoin to public equity to ETH is incredibly high. Mm. And there are people that would absolutely drive liquidity into an ecosystem that could support that. And I think that's, that's what we're getting very close to bringing to fruition. Very cool. Please send us the questions because we only have a few more minutes left and then you guys are up, you guys asking the questions. Um, what's, because you know, you've, you've mentioned that you worked as a trader, you had a hedge fund, you sort of uh, sold companies. Um, what's interesting for you about this space? And, you know, what would be the sort of thing that makes you go, actually, you know, sod this, I'm out? So, so the, the, the key about what we're talking about with the marketplace, for example, is you're not just getting rid of Euroclear or DTC. You're not just getting rid of the LSE or, or the NASDAQ or the NYSE. A true decentralized exchange, you don't need an introducing broker. You don't need Schwab, TD, Robinhood. They all go away too. Mm. And so the level of disruption that you're bringing into the marketplace is massive. And you couple that with you know, transactional activity, interchange, getting rid of Visa and MasterCard. You're just talking about trillions of dollars of, of market cap reallocation that's going to happen on the back of this technology. And people have been talking about this for years, you know, five years, six years. They've been arguing the, the, the promise. And the blockchain industry has done a phenomenal job shooting itself in the foot on a regular basis. So it started with the ICO fiasco, then the NFT balloons, then, you know, FTX. It's just been one problem after another. I can tell you that there's real world transactions going through right now that by design don't have an enormous amount of publicity around them, but are transformative, have major financial institutions participating and can demonstrate real economic value. And that real economic value is what's gonna be the catalyst to actually get this to the next step. And it will happen very fast and it will happen over the next couple of years. You're gonna see a massive transformation through blockchain. So do you think that there is, um, you know, at the moment, the way that traditional financial system is set up, clearly, you know, there are lots of winners. You've got lots of people collecting, you know, right. a, a fee and they're making a living along the way. Um, so what exactly is going to drive this shift? Because it sounds to me like it's a very tough value proposition to turn up to someone and say, hey, you know that thing you make billions from yearly? We're going to make that better, but you're not going to make that money anymore. So, so the key is to, to understand the right markets to go after where the decision makers are the ones that benefit from the technology. So, for example, uh, you know, if you look at, I sell mortgages to JP Morgan, I sell them on the blockchain. They get instant delivery. If I sold them mortgages the old way, Deutsche Bank would take possession of the file, they'd charge them money, and they'd bring it over to them and deliver it to them. JP Morgan's thrilled to cut Deutsche Bank out of the process and get the loans faster and save money. Now, if I went to JP Morgan and said, hey, I want to use blockchain for levered loans and CLOs, they'd say, well, wait a minute, we are in float for 120 days, it takes for the loans to settle. We don't like that blockchain use case. So we have to find the use cases where the proponent or the advocate is the one getting the economic benefit, but fortunately, there's a lot of those. Um, can you give us a few examples, please? Sure, so interchange. So JP Morgan is the largest issuing processor in, in, the, in the world. Uh, for interchange cards, but they hate paying Visa and MasterCard to sit in the middle. So what if you had a stable coin, a regulatory compliant coin, that they could go to all their business customers with and say, look, I will set you up to take this as payment. And then JP Morgan becomes merchant acquirer and issuing bank, cuts out issuing processor, Visa, Ma uh, MasterCard interchange, um, Square and, and Stripe, and, and is the merchant, uh, merchant bank on the back end. So. I think you're going to see these things happen. And of course, they're predicated, I said, if they had a regulatory compliance stablecoin. I think what you'll see coming out of the US, even though the US is very challenged from a regulatory standpoint, in the next several months, you will start to see security versions of stablecoin that yield, that are public securities, and that are freely transferable peer to peer and institution to institution. That is, a, is going to be a seismic shift into the market, and people aren't prepared for it yet. What about central banks and regulators? You mentioned, you know, regulators uh, briefly earlier. Um, what role do they play in this new ecosystem? And actually, do you see banks in this new world? Yeah, I, I think that um, obviously there's a lot of discussion around CBDC, central bank digital currencies, and, and the reality is 
they're better than stablecoin because stablecoin goes back to that whole point I tried I started the conversation off with which is you shouldn't have to trust anyone mm. and you know when you have a stablecoin you have to trust that there's assets behind that coin versus if it's dollars or pounds or euros you know it's dollars pounds and euros in digital form so I think there is a role for the CBDCs I think in the US the Fed has an extremely challenging position because the launch of a CBDC would be the end of the banking system as it's defined and that's it was a retail CBDC, I guess. That's right. right that's right. And it, and it would be a significant um, and, and that's really where the value is, because you have real time payment that that in terms of institutional settlement or cross bank settlement, there's other ways they can do this where they don't need blockchain. It's really getting to retail for transactional commerce to avoid interchange. Well, I don't know. I come from a world of FX a little bit and there's SWIFT, there's CLS. There's a lot on the settlement side, I think, that can be. Yeah, potentially and potentially improved. Absolutely. So, so a bearer asset can solve the cross-border remit problems that you have, and so it eliminates the need for SWIFT. You don't need a messaging protocol. This is what you know. If if you go to the U.S., there's there's these things called Coinstar, where you go to the grocery store and you dump all your change in them, and they give you out of an Apple gift card. The number one reason that those are used today is to buy Bitcoin to move it to your relatives who don't live in the U.S., right? And it it's just illustrative of how much friction there is in money movement processes that people are doing it through a Coinstar terminal with Bitcoin. Thank you. Uh, look at that. We've got some questions just before we got to uh, our uh, drinks time. Thank you. Um, would traditional service providers like fun fund administrators and auditors still be required? So. Uh, until you get the assets on the blockchain, you're still going to need some combination of fund administration and audit because you're going to have to validate that the assets are actually there. Um, once the assets become digital, I think you're going to change the construct and the whole notion of a qualified custodian eventually goes away because as a customer, I can look through and I can see the assets are there and prove it out. Does that need a lot of, like, I hate this word, but you know, does that need a lot of, um, kind of uh, responsibility and education from the users because at the moment you don't need to worry about those things. So, so I, today 10 of the top 20 mortgage companies in the US use my tech to originate assets. Those assets are all on blockchain. They have no idea they're on blockchain. They don't need to know it. It's just technology to them. So I don't think it's any more of a significant hurdle if it's designed well than any other technology and adoption for technology. Thank you. Um, what do you think will be the potential catalysts that can act as the inflection point for DEX trading dominance in crypto? One could be lifting a giant uh, old centralized exchange out of bankruptcy. So that, that could, be a, <laughs> could be a real catalyst to do it. Um, like, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a run at, at standing up a true decentralized exchange that cuts across multiple assets that will have the involvement of very large market makers facilitating liquidity on the crypto side. Um, and whether we're successful or not, we'll see. Whether that involves lifting a company out of bankruptcy, we'll see. Um, but there is a, a, you know, a dearth of, of solutions in the marketplace right now, and someone needs to lean in and do it. And so you know, we're going to take a shot. One question from me, please. Um, how do you guys make your money? So w we have two different functional business lines. So we have a, a lending business line um, that does blockchain origination, blockchain securitization. Block it's now working with Goldman and, and JP Morgan to do blockchain TBA and um, pass through markets. That, this, that company this year will make $300 million of revenue and do about $60 million of profit. Um, then we have a markets business, which is the broker-dealer, the ATS, um, the money transmission licenses, all of the things that we need to stand up the decentralized exchange and challenge the centralized exchanges. That's more in the, the tens of millions of dollars of revenue number right now, but, but you know, there's a path to ramp that pretty significantly. So a similar way, but just charging a bit less and fewer intermediaries. That's, that's right. And, and really, the, the revenue that comes off of that's coming from the margin lending and from the asset management component, not so much the transactional fees. Thank you. And the last question we have is, uh, why do you think uh, the adoption of tokenization by asset managers and originators is so slow? So I think there's, there's two reasons for it. One is people tokenize the wrong things. And, and I, I bristle at the word tokenization because I go back to like IBM's commercial where they say, we use the blockchain to track your strawberries. That's a stupid application of blockchain. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Like, how do you know where the strawberries are? And who, maybe someone swapped them out. The blockchain doesn't have eyes. Someone might have eaten it. Right. And, and so, so I, think, I think there's been a misguided emphasis or focus on what to tokenize. 
it only works if it's a native digital asset and it starts its life on the blockchain. You have to have immutable history from the origin to the point in time that you're looking at it. That's what's valuable. The other aspect is tokenizing, um, you know, not just things that aren't native digitally, but, but the wrong things that, that with the false premise that you can create liquidity. So a lot of people feel I can put real estate on the blockchain, all of a sudden it'll have liquidity. You don't have liquidity unless you have homogeneity and you have market making. And so this is why we haven't seen a lot of success historically. I'd say we've had a lot of success with private company stock, with closed end funds, um, but not the kind of success I think we have when we start leaning into crypto on a DEX basis and public equity certainly on a DEX basis. And a final question from me, please, is do you think that there is still a lot of BS in the crypto space, and do you see it getting better? I think, I think a lot of it was humbled or normalized in the bankruptcy issues that we just went through. Um, I think the fundamental issue, the, the, first off, the idea of, of tokenomics being driven by scarcity now is finally out the window. We don't have to deal with that anymore. You know, we have to deal with, there needs to be an actual true revenue model of, of that accretes into that token to get that to work. And crypto is necessary for blockchain to function, in particular proof of stake blockchain, it's a necessary component, but it has to have a very clear use case of how fees generate into that and support it. And I think, I think the, the industry has been humbled in normalizing itself more to those use cases. And this is part why you see so much emphasis now on real world assets. You know, everyone started going around talking about RWAs, and I thought they, they meant risk-weighted risk adjustments. I didn't know what they were talking. And I'm, I'm the biggest risk-weighted asset originator out there at 15 billion, but, you know, and I, we use Provenance, which, which we now have in Europe, where we've done, I think, now $10 billion of locked asset value. So um, that trend, I think, is very illustrative of people actually getting real about the technology. I think this is a good place to finish. Thank you so much, Mike. Please join me in thanking Mike for his contribution. Thanks. Thank you.